And one of the nice things about cultivating our mindful awareness practice is we actually learn how to wait. <laughs> you know how it is. So many places in our lives we have to wait in traffic, at the store, whatever. But it's really nice to discover that the mind knows what to do when we're in this pause, this waiting. It's like it can be present. And it's a really functional thing to do when we're waiting. Just, And it's not a, you know, it's just the opposite of tension, right? Because when we're being present, it's those two, valuing those two things, relaxation and being open or being interested or being alert, right? So it's the coming together of those two qualities. So welcome back everyone. We have some brave souls here in the room in Minneapolis on this cold night in Minnesota. And for those in the room, we have about 35 people online. And this is the fourth week of our six week introduction to mindful awareness practice, Buddhist awareness practice. I sometimes call it human common sense, <laughs> you know? I mean, I think I might've even mentioned this to the group, but can you imagine somebody making an argument like writing a book, you know, the best, <clears throat> like a self-help book, the best way through life, distraction. Like I found that I've discovered the way, just don't be present and you'll do fine in your life, right? I mean, no one would ever write that book, but we don't, it doesn't occur to us it's almost too commonsensical, but because we, it never clearly directly occurs to us to, to value being present, we never kind of get behind it. And actually that's as much of the practice, especially like for the introduction as you're kind of realizing, oh yeah, this is a good thing. It's we, we want to learn to value being present. And being present again, just I'm defining it in a very simple way. It's the coming together of being both physically, mentally, emotionally relaxed and alert. And the coming together of those two things. So not alert with tension or not relaxed and dull, but the coming together of that bright, alert, curious, but not tight, relaxed, soft, open, trusting. And I say this, you know, with week four, just a couple of weeks left, we really, you know, if you're able, if you've been able to put in a little formal meditation time each day, then at this point in the class, you really want to begin to notice it throughout the day in little bits and pieces, right? Because, you know, unfortunately, most of us were on autopilot for a good part of the day, meaning, of course, we're conscious, but we're not mindfully aware, oh, it's like this down, right? We're just sort of going through the motions. I think I've mentioned, you know, we can drive home and then we're walking in the door and we realized, I don't really remember driving home. Clearly I was conscious, I was making the right turns and whatever, but there wasn't that reflective knowing, you know, touching the steering wheel is like this, slowing down, speeding up is like this, not liking the traffic is like this. There wasn't that reflective knowing where the mind, wisdom knew that it's like this now with any kind of continuity. And that's a, that sort of characterizes most of our waking day. So in a way, our formal sitting time, like if you can get 30 minutes in a day, that would be great. More is better, less is better than none. Even five minutes is better than no time where you're sitting in a safe, comfortable, upright place at your home Cell phone is off. People you live with have been told to just leave you be. 
not in a really cluttered or place where there are a lot of things around that trigger reactivity or trigger a lot of mental activity, a lot of thought, right? So we're, we're choosing the time and the place and the way that uh, just because the more simple the environment, the more likely we can build that momentum, that interest and valuing of being present. So in a way we're planting seeds during the formal time so that it's more likely to rise throughout the day. Now on week four, I usually talk a little bit about how to work with obstacles. And I think I might even mention last week that the homework in a sense is to get really interested. What is it that interrupts present moment awareness? Uh, yeah, so normally in week four, we talk about what interrupts the continuity of awareness. And interestingly, it isn't like I wanna know what interrupts the continuity of present moment awareness so I can get back to present moment awareness. I mean, that's partly true, but we wanna know what interrupts the continuity of present moment awareness because that's what's happening in a moment, right? The mind in a sense is getting hijacked. It's like we're, we get a little momentum in our practice, a little continuity of being present, breathing in is like this, breathing out is like this, Breathing in is like this, breathing out is like this. It's like you're on the interstate and the awareness is continuous. And then there's an off ramp, a Dairy Queen, you see the sign. And before you know it, you're, and you're lost in thought, you've taken the off ramp. So what we wanna do is get, realize that that's part of what happens in the present moment, impulses, to worry, impulses to plan, impulses to compare this sit to another sit, impulses to hate the sensations I'm feeling in my knee or the disturbing sound or the cool temperature in the room, you know, to like or dislike one thing after another, whether it's liking or disliking our thoughts or liking or disliking our mood or liking or disliking the sensations in the body or liking and disliking sound or sights, smells and tastes. That's kind of the usual world that the mind is preoccupied with, liking and disliking. And in a, in a weird and I think terrible way, it's really oppressive how addicted maybe our minds are. It's just, we don't really feel we're alive unless the mind is spinning about what I like or spinning about what I don't like. And when we get together in community, what do we talk about? Our likes and dislikes. I mean, that would be just an interesting homework assignment, right? To like just to statistically keep track of our internal dialogue and our external dialogue for the next week and what percentage of our own internal dialogue and external dialogue has to do with talking about our likes and dislikes. It animates our life in a very real way. And it's agitating, it's not settling. And it doesn't mean we're gonna pretend we don't like and dislike things. We're conditioned to like what we like and we're conditioned to dislike what we don't like or to be afraid. We don't actually have to change that. It's more having a more spacious um, relationship to our likes and dislikes. Like if you have your favorite brand or flavor of ice cream at home and you like ice cream, you know, and, the, and that thought comes up during the program tonight you know, and so you remember there's your favorite food in the fridge or whatever, freezer, and you remember you like it. And maybe there's an emotional reaction like, oh boy, that will be great or whatever, you know, happens. But wisdom can see, wisdom and awareness can recognize all of that without being thrown off balance. Oh, that's just the mind anticipating a really nice sense experience that is likely to 
occur, <laughs> you know, as soon as I'm free of the Zoom meeting or as soon as I'm able to get home, right? We don't have to, the heart doesn't have to get thrown off just because there's liking or maybe something exciting is going to happen tomorrow or maybe something really difficult is going to happen tomorrow. But we don't have to be thrown off by that. There can just be that simple, mindful recognition. Oh, the mind is afraid and it feels like this. The mind is excited and it feels like this, right? So after the guided sit tonight, we'll talk about what interrupts the continuity of present moment awareness. Because what, you know, it's what kind of effort do we need to be present? And just check right now, each of us with our own experience, what kind of effort does it take for us right now to just realize it feels like this now, sitting, being present, hearing Mark's voice is like this now. The reality of sitting feels like this. Mental activity is like this now. Because the awareness, that capacity is already in a sense built in. So it isn't so much I have to be aware as much as it is remembering to recognize awareness, remembering to recognize the present moment. The word sati, which usually gets translated as awareness or mindfulness, um, it actually has its roots in remembering. So the kind of the root meaning, like that mindfulness is remembering this is being known. And that's really the effort we're making. It's more an effort of remembering than it is some kind of effort of me bringing my attention to something. Because the present moment, the heart, the mind, it's already that capacity of awareness. It's already there. So you or I, we don't have to make an effort. We just need to remember that the sensitivity, that this knowing is happening. We have to remember to recognize it, right? So now we're remembering to recognize the present moment. And I'll just stop talking for a minute or so. And just see if you can notice how we lose the thread of the present moment. And I wanted to do this little experiment because you can start to better understand the need for an anchor. Like if, like I notice, because the mind tends to find one anyway, I have my computer in front of me. And so just the visual experience became a way for the mind to stabilize present moment awareness. How do I know I'm aware? Because I'm seeing, I'm seeing the computer seen as being known, right? Same thing with whether you use the breath or the awareness of the whole body sitting or awareness of hearing. Because then when we get lost in thought, the contrast from being with our anchor, oh, this is being known, this is being known. And then all of a sudden we're lost in thought. That really, it's like a little alarm clock. Oh, you've lost the thread of the present moment. So the anchor kind of creates the contrast, the continuity of awareness with your meditation anchor creates the base. So when the mind, it doesn't know it's distracted, it 
it knows it's no longer aware of the base, and then it gets curious. Oh, this is being known. But the moment before, the mind was lost in thought, but it didn't know it was lost in thought. That's called distraction. When we know we're distracted, that's not distraction, that's awareness. We're already back in the practice, right? Because the mind is aware, oh, this is what's being known, not the anchor. But that's not distraction then. Like to, to kind of feel the reverberation of having been fantasizing about something, oh, then we know we don't need to get frustrated because we're already back in the present moment. This is being known. This is what it feels like to have been lost in thought. And you might even notice a kind of push-pull like the mind wants to go back to the, the content. You know how it is when we wake up from a dream and there's an awareness, oh, I've been dreaming. But you kind of want to go back, right? It's like a magnetic pull back to the content. And not just the content, but being lost in the content, absorbed in it. So there's no awareness that dreaming's happening. Just like when we get lost into imagining what's going to happen tomorrow, regurgitating what happened earlier today, there's not awareness that this is that the mind is thinking. The mind is lost in the content, right? But in those moments where we're kind of <clears throat> teetering, not really lost, but under the influence of the impulse to go back, then that's a really good place. And one of the key things to do there is to get interested, what's the underlying feeling here? So when you're dealing with distraction in your meditation practice, and anytime during the day, that question can be very clarifying. So you might want to even memorize it. It's just a very wholesome question to ask yourself. What's the underlying feeling here? The kind of feeling tone, pleasantness or unpleasantness? Because the content of our thoughts are very seductive, they kind of take us into that of being absorbed in the content and therefore not aware these are just thoughts being known. But when we ask the question, well, what's the underlying feeling here? What's the feeling here? Oh, it feels like this. That's very grounding in the present moment. Like, how's the body? Is it tight? You know, given that I've been thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's the underlying feeling? A little tension? What's that feel like? A little excitement? What's that feel like? What's the feeling here? Oh, it feels like this. So this is, uh, the Buddha really emphasizes this whole body awareness in part because it really supports continuity of awareness through the day. Because it's a, as we're doing our day, you know, talking, doing this, doing that, <clears throat> it's relatively easy to remember there's a body here and it feels like this. And then when we, because so much of the day we are thinking and we're talking and every thought and every conversation, there's an emotional underlying feeling with it, right? It's, there's a charge and the charge is less seductive than the content. It's like more authentic or more grounding or less likely to cause the mind to get confused. And by confused, I mean, when we're thinking, you know, the, the, the abstraction of thought, when I imagine something like with visual imagery and, or think of something, it sort of creates a reality. Like I think of Wisconsin, <laughs> you know, or I think of our common grounds retreat property in Wisconsin. And, and all of a sudden, I forget I'm sitting here and, and being here and now, right? Because that abstract thought and those mental images, like a dream, it became the reality for a while. But when I am curious about the feeling, when I think about the retreat property, what's the feeling here? For me, it's a little ten tense because it's like a lot of things I need to do. <laughs> you know, it's like my job site. Right? Oh, we got to do this. We got to figure out that. And we got to plan that. So, oh, 
what's the feeling? Oh, it's burdensome. You know, like, oh, there's a lot we need to take care of. Okay. Where's that feeling? It's here and now. It's being known here and now. Can I be relaxed? Can I be open? Can I be curious? Can there be a way to have kind of authentic presence with what's moving here and now? And then we're out of the bubble, the distraction. So that's just a little um, technique, I guess you could say, that you can practice with during the sit is <clears throat> really rely on an anchor, like being with the breath from the beginning of the in-breath all the way through, from the beginning of the out-breath all the way through. But remember, we don't have to control the breath. However your body is breathing is fine. It's not a breath technique in terms of breathing a particular way. It's just using the natural phenomena of breathing in and breathing out as a convenient anchor to support present moment awareness, right? Because breathing in only happens in the present moment. Breathing out only happens in the present moment. So we just conveniently use that. But you could instead use the totality of the experience of the body sitting, just the full expression of sensation in the body, or you can use hearing. So those are the, you know, there's others, but those are the three useful anchors uh, that I usually offer in the introduction class that you can come back to. And then because you've chosen to be with one of those three anchors, you're more likely to notice when the mind is distracted. Sometimes you don't have to do anything, just knowing and you find yourself right back with your anchor. And sometimes the distraction is so seductive, you really have to let it come front and center. So you're really looking at the tendency to wanna to think about something, or you're really looking at the painful sensations that are triggering a lot of reactivity or thought. You just invite it right into the forefront of attention. Okay. This, in, my, in a sense, this is my anchor now, the thing that's distracting the mind. And we just like, and then obviously, if it's an unpleasant thing, more than the experience might be the not liking of it. So then not liking of it becomes the object that the mind knows. Oh, not liking is like this. But when we're in this territory, that question, well, what's the underlying feeling here? What does it feel like? And you can even ask like, what does it feel like in the body? Is there a tension in the body that corresponds with this content or this reactivity? Is there tension or is there a sense of release? What does it feel like energetically here and now? Because that's very grounding in the present moment. And then you might find without you trying to get rid of the distraction, it expresses this very deep truth that everything comes and everything goes. I mean, think about it. How many distractions have arisen in our minds over the years? I mean, almost an infinite number. And where have they gone? They've arisen and they passed. And so if we're just patient and willing to feel the way it feels, all of these distractions that are likely to arise for us during the 30 minute sit we're about to have, they will express that same principle of arising and then passing in their own time. And it will be very empowering because you'll sense, oh, I don't have to control these distractions. I just need to be aware of them and they'll pass away on their own. And it really helps us to settle more deeply into the practice, just staying here in this embodied moment when, when something is seductive in the sense of taking the mind into this spinning, this mental proliferation, then really use the, well, what's the underlying feeling here? Can I feel this? What happens if I get interested and really relax with the underlying feeling. Keep it almost like 
let it become in the forefront of awareness. Oh, it feels like this. And use the language sometimes, like uh, literally ask that question in, silently, of course, in your mind. And also you can name the experience. Oh, this is just the planning mind, planning. It's just planning being known. Well, what's the underlying feeling here? Oh, it feels like this. So some of that self-talk, languaging, labeling, whatever you want to call it, can be useful. Definitely at times it will be useful. You don't need to use it all the time. But in a class like this, you want to experiment so that when you need that kind of skillful self-talk, you have a little experience with it. It's not new because you, you've played with it or you tried it out. So try it out tonight, you know, some of these phrases that I'm recommending, okay? So go ahead and stand or stretch or whatever you think you need to do so you can sit comfortably for about 30 minutes. We'll take maybe three minutes, do what you need to do. And you can even be mindful as you're moving about and <clears throat> and when you feel ready, just begin to settle back in, but take your time. No hurry. And for those who are already settled into your sitting posture, remember it can be a nice simple ritual to take a minute or two to do a few of those long, easy, deep breaths where you take your time to fill the lungs, take your time to slowly, easily empty the lungs, it's in a way, it's a very simple expression of generosity, right? We're giving the body oxygen. And it's just such a simple way to come more fully into the experience of the body. And of course, the body bodily sensations are always here and now in the present moment. So maybe one or two more of these easy breaths, take your time. Eventually you can allow the breathing to continue on its own and even be grateful that the body can do the breathing without the mind needing to manage it. We just trust the body to breathe, even if we don't think it's smooth enough or deep enough, we just trust the body to do the breathing. And as we've been doing these last few weeks, we'll begin being aware of hearing because it's a nice way to remember how receptive present moment awareness can be. So relaxed and alert to the experience of hearing. And it becomes quite obvious that we don't need to make an effort to hear because hearing is already happening. We're just keeping hearing in mind.
And we don't have to pick and choose what sounds are worthy. Simply receiving the totality of the experience of hearing. And notice how peaceful and how settling that is. It's really important to cultivate a taste for what's simple and ordinary. And then we bring this receptive awareness now to the experience of the sitting body. And again, we don't have to direct the attention to the body because the mind is already sensitive, already aware of the sensations of the body. So in a sense, we're noticing this exposure or the sensitivity to the sit sitting body. Everything belongs. We're not picking and choosing which sensations to feel. Of course, some stronger sensations might come to the forefront of attention, but we're keeping in mind the totality of the sitting body. And here's a place you can use some of that skillful self-talk. For example, the phrase, sitting is like this now. Or sitting feels like this now. The sitting body is being known. Can this be okay? Just to let these sensations be. So whenever it feels helpful, appropriate, just experiment by naming the experience that's being known in a really simple way. <clears throat> <clears throat> and some of you may prefer to continue with this whole body awareness as your primary anchor and others might prefer a more specific anchor feeling the breathing in from the beginning of the in-breath to the end, feeling the sensations of breathing out from the beginning until the end. Of course, just relaxing and letting the breathing rhythm be whatever it is. And even if you wanna continue with the whole body, you can coordinate your awareness of the body with the breathing in. So for example, breathing in, experiencing the whole body. While breathing out, experiencing the whole body just as it is. Keeping the meditation anchor in mind as best you can. Be willing to begin again and again. And when there's a strong interruption, a strong distraction, then just simply get curious. 
what's in the way of being with the anchor? Oh, this is being known. So we have a friendly relationship around the distractions. Well, what's the underlying feeling? So we're gonna continue in silence and just do the best you can. Get really interested in that continuity of present moment awareness and really interested in what interrupts it. It's all about the learning, not about controlling your experience. And what really helps the practice develop is to sense the pleasure of the simplicity, the pleasure of being present. It's subtle, but it's real. And it really helps develop the momentum in the practice.
Notice where the mind is, present or lost in thought. No need to judge. Notice what the underlying feeling is here and now. Notice how distractions cease on their own. No need to get frustrated. It's the nature or the habit of the mind to think. So we don't need to be upset. Just acknowledge the way it is and acknowledge the underlying feeling. It's like this now. And recognize the anchor that you've chosen, whole body awareness or awareness of breathing in and breathing out or awareness of hearing. And let that anchor become a good friend in a sense. And really appreciate the pleasure of being present and the simplicity of being present with this anchor
And remember to experiment with naming any persistent distraction. Just give it a name, like planning mind. Oh, planning mind is being known. It feels like this. Worrying is being known. It feels like this. Doubt is being known. It feels like this. Restlessness, sleepiness, wanting mind. These are the common hindrances. And it really helps just to name them. It's not about being angry at them or controlling even. It's just acknowledging what's being known and what's being felt.
And now when you feel ready, just allow the eyes to open if they've been closed. And we'll hold the body still for another couple minutes. But we can let go of the attention with the anchor. And just remember the six sense gates, seeing is being known. And seeing is not the same as looking around. It's just aware of this visual experience being known. And of course, hearing being known, hearings like this. And touching all the diversity of physical sensations being felt, being known. And to some degree, smelling and tasting also being known. So the five physical senses, just really embracing the sensitivity through the five physical senses. Alert and relaxed, present. Then also, of course, aware of mental activity, thoughts, the mood, quality of the mind, quality of the heart. And all six of these sense gates together is just the way it is. Being a human being is like this now. Can it be okay just to let the conditions be the way they are? Just exploring for the last few seconds being with these changing conditions in a peaceful way, in a clear and relaxed way. And then when you feel ready, if you like putting your hands together, you can do that or however you like to end your sitting time. And then we, in a relaxed, easy way, we begin to move the body, stretch a little, whatever you need to do to take care of your body. But so hopefully we've learned a few things about continuity of awareness and what gets in the way and how mental labeling or a skillful use of this, uh, you know, I'd call it meditation talk. Because, <laughs> you know, thought, you know, thought is like a really useful tool. It isn't the bad guy. Sometimes we think thoughts, you know, it's sort of, God, if only I didn't think. And there's, so in this sense, there's skillful thoughts. Skillful thoughts are thoughts that turn the attention in a wise way to the present moment. And therefore, unskillful thoughts are thoughts that just lead to more thinking, <laughs> you know, and awareness, consciousness sort of entrapped, gets caught up, gets lost in the content, lost in the sense like I mentioned earlier, there's no awareness that this is how it is now. You know, when I'm lost in thought, I'm not aware I'm lost in thought or that I'm thinking about this, planning a renovation or whatever, you know, we might be doing. 
So as uh, hopefully you recognize, we learn a lot from hearing people ask questions and sharing experience, either from your sit tonight, but also of course, from your practice at home, including informal daily life practice. And maybe some of you have experimented with the walking practice. And if you haven't, it'd be really good. So there's a handout, every email that I've sent you um, has a link to the handouts that go with the course. And there's one handout on walking practice from Gil Fransdahl, a wonderful teacher on the West Coast at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, which is in the south part of the San Francisco Bay, close to Palo Alto. It's one of our bigger centers, urban centers uh, in this tradition of early Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism here in the, the West. Usually we call them Insight Meditation Centers. And uh, he has a nice, I think just a couple page description of walking meditation practice. So it's really nice to do that a few times before the end of the course, just so you have a sense how walking can be a way to really cultivate that continuity of present moment awareness. It doesn't have to be just from sitting still. We actually, the Buddha teaches, you know, we want to be able to do it in four postures, lying down. So you should practice sometimes just... Not so much on a bed, although you can do it on a bed, but like a yoga mat or a comfortable carpet, maybe with a little pillow for the back of the head. So you feel like the spine is pretty straight, even though you're lying down, arms comfortably to the sides, legs comfortably apart. If you have lower back tension, you can actually, you know, put your calves on a chair and that can flatten the lower back and uh, take care of lower back tension for some of you. So lying down standing, very good posture for meditation. Generally have your knees a little bent when you're doing a standing meditation. Now you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that for 30 minutes, but for 10 minutes, it could be a really useful just standing. You can stand and look out at a bird feeder. And then sitting, of course, we've been practicing a lot of that. And then the fourth is walking. So we really, Make sure before the end of the course, you formally explore all four of those basic meditation postures, walking, sitting, standing, and lying down. Because you, you don't want to think, oh, if I'm not doing this, you know, sitting cross-legged or sitting in a chair in an upright way, I'm not meditating. And like I said, anyway, you know, the formal meditation is really here to support the continuity of mindfulness throughout the day. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say. And people in the room, if you wanna speak, if you feel, if you're willing, you could even come and sit here and I'll hand you the, the mic so that people online can hear you. But people online, you can just unmute yourself. And uh, what have you been learning this last week? What did you discover during the sit, especially around what gets in the way of the continuity of mindful awareness? How did you work with that? Did you use some mental noting or labeling? Did being aware of the underlying feeling help? What questions are emerging about the practice after these four weeks? Yeah, and I think it is a profound shift because, you know, it's a little bit what I was talking about earlier, where you saw that desire to share and the mind initially was, it kind of believed the story that, oh, this would be nice to share. And, and in a certain way, there's some truth to that. But what we're interested is the underlying feeling, like what's really going on here. And that's where you had the deeper understanding. Oh, this is just wanting right? Because it might be nice to share, but what's really relevant in terms of uh, what's being known in our subjective experiences, there's wanting going on and wanting feels like this. So the interesting question, if you want to add a little, because we just want to keep seeing the way it is and the mind is going to react and then it's going to react to its reaction. And then, but it's just really good to see. And that's what te uh, teases out these habits of getting all bound up 
is just to keep seeing them for what they are, their mental habits. They arise and pass away lawfully, you know, due to the causes and conditions. So, of course, we have this new thing, mindfulness meditation. It's very common for lots of thoughts to arise. Oh, I should tell other people about this. It's actually described all the way back at the time of the Buddha. They mapped out this thing. It's called an imbalance between faith and wisdom, where you know, we, we stumble upon something that's actually pretty remarkable. You know, it's a pretty powerful practice and it inspires a lot of this faith energy and we don't know what to do with it. So we think, I'm going to teach my mom. I'm going to tell my kids about this. You know, my friend, hey, you should do this. You know, and we find ourselves being a preacher. So I'm sure, you know, feel free to raise your hand if you notice that in your uh, in the last few weeks, because it's very common, right? What we want to notice is in a non-judgmental way, it's just simple truth. Oh, this is wanting. There's a little liberation there. It's like when I recognize clearly the wanting, then the mind isn't so caught by it, right? There's some freedom because the freedom is I can just be aware. And then whether I share it or not, I'm not compelled to share it. If it's appropriate, I can say something, but I'm not attached to sharing it. And there's freedom in that. And just in a simple way, the Buddha made the same point you made, and he actually turned it into a practice instruction, which is um, to practice as if you're sick. Huh. Because exact right, and I bet other people have had this experience. And it's not just being sick. It's also like when things get intense, like really difficult, that you'll notice mindfulness is just more available. And, it's, and then when things start working better, you feel better, you're not so sick. You, you feel, oh, I don't need mindfulness because things are, and your mind, you know, sort of has permission to get to do whatever it wants to do and it can start spinning again and but there's something about like when we're really hurting like you know the head hurts the body aches the nasal passages are plugged it's like if i don't stay present i'm going to get i'm going to react to the physical discomfort of being sick by getting tight but if i stay vigilant really present then i'll be with the pain but I won't be, and some of you might know this uh, simile, the shooting the second arrow. I don't know how many, did I mention that simile from the Buddhist teachings? It's a really useful little, you know, similes are a powerful way to remember different parts of the practice. So this simile is usually described as shooting the second arrow. And so the Buddha said, this is like a paraphrase, but the Buddha said, being a human being, we're gonna get shot with a lot of arrows. It's all the ordinary insults that come our way. Too cold, somebody treating, mistreating us, you know, too hot, stub our toe, get sick. These are the ordinary, unavoidable pains that come with living. And it, some of us, you know, just through bad fortune have more. Some of us through good fortune have less, but we all have this, these array, the first arrow. The second arrow is when there is an insult, then we react to it by not liking being sick. And you know how that is, especially the first day when we're first, and often our reaction is, I cannot get sick. I got so much to do, you know? And then we're basically energetically doing this. Does that help? No. <laughs> if anything, it makes us, you know, it just makes us more vulnerable to the cold because we're adding all this stress. We're adding the second arrow. And so the, the issue is when we have the first arrow, sometimes, especially if it's strong, like when we're really sick, we get vigilant in a way like, I don't know much, but I don't want to add the second arrow. I don't want to be related to the effects of getting the booster shot and having all the flu symptoms that could come with that. I don't want to react to all of that discomfort in a way that makes it even worse. So there's this natural incentive to stay present right with 
the unpleasant conditions and anything else that's happening in the present moment so that I'll be aware if the mind starts to relate to this in ways that add the second arrow. Because that we have a lot of freedom to avoid if we're present. If we're not present, we're gonna add the second arrow because it's our habit. When we're too cold, we get tight. You know, When we're too hot, we get tight. When we're around people we don't like, we get tight. When we're around people we do like and we want them to like us, we get tight. We shoot the second arrow all the time, unconsciously. It's just the habit. And mindfulness helps us avoid it. I bet if we could uh, you know, see everybody online, I know a lot of you have your videos off, but you know, for those of you who have your video on, just put your hand up if you have trouble with sleepiness. Because you know, in the tradition, it is a formidable adversary, dullness. Right? There are five formidable adversaries to meditation practice. They're called the five hindrances. It's actually kind of a nice list to memorize because then when you're having a hard time in your sit, you can go, which of the hindrances are present in this heart and mind right now? So you could probably guess these. Most of you could guess most of these five. So there's wanting mind, right? There's the not wanting mind, so some kind of aversion, wanting to get rid of something like, I've got pain in my knee, if only I didn't have this pain in my knee, right? So that's kind of a pair, wanting and not wanting, greed and aversion. And then there's too little energy, dullness and sleepiness. So dullness is just that heaviness of the mind, and then sleepiness is that sort of, you know, it's in the body. So too little energy, and then the opposite, too much energy, restlessness, worrying, you know, just the mind spinning. And then the fifth is doubt. Now, some doubt is skillful, but this is like a doubt that just is spinning. You know, we're, we're not actually getting closer to anything. We're just doubting ourselves, doubting the practice. So with sleepiness, like really respecting it, that's the first thing. And because it's relevant, like if you're not getting enough sleep, well, the first step, <laughs> arrange your life so you get more sleep. But even those of us who get a lot of sleep, getting enough sleep, good sleep, this can be a formidable problem in meditation. So if you have been practicing, you know, we can get pretty good at settling the body and the mind, calming the system down, right? And remember, there's this uh, necessary balancing between all of the skill of settling the body and the mind and all the skill that's needed to brighten the mind. And we'll be better, naturally better at one more than the other. <clears throat> so if you're good at settling, then the question, what could someone like Jessica, but most of us, do to increase the alertness and the brightness. And interestingly, what brings energy into the mind, so assuming that we're just not exhausted and need a sleep, and the sleepiness is really the result of this imbalance, then the, the question is, as we're sitting there, what can I do to bring in more energy? And the answer is, it sort of can be surprising. Making effort is energizing. See, we normally think I need energy to make effort, but actually it's the other way around. And I bet we all kind of know that experience. Like, you know how you are, you're dead to the world or whatever, some weekend, just kind of lethargic laying around. And of course, the more we lay around, the more tired we get. But if we do stumble upon something we, and we get involved and we start, all of a sudden the mind comes back into balance. We don't feel sleepy anymore. So in the context of sitting, asking the mind to do more. So one thing is we could expand the field of awareness. Like Jessica said, she opened her eyes. And then there's just more present moment experience to be present with. They're seeing, 
there's hearing, right? So we can open up the field of awareness. So instead of a specific anchor, more narrow awareness at the tip of the nose, you might include more objects of experience. So there's more activity being known. You could ask your mind to name what it's knowing because it takes work to mentally, you know, silently in your mind, but to mentally label or name experience. And that work energizes the mind. Try it. It really works. So that those are some of the things. But, but sometimes just uh, opening the eyes like you discovered or even standing. Do the practice standing or do walking practice. And you could, you don't need a big space. I mean, it's nice to have, you know, like the length of this room, which is about 40 feet, that would be great. But even 10 to 15 feet, you could just walk slowly and you just get into the physicality of the lifting and the swinging the, the foot and leg and the dropping and the pressing in and the lifting, the lifting, the moving, moving, the dropping, the pressing, the pressing, the lifting. And that generally, because the eyes are open and the body's moving, it takes more effort to be present to all of that. And that brightens the mind. And, and it also can relate to a shift in our understanding. Like a lot of us begin our practice because we just have a lot of stress in our life. And even though we're getting the instructions correctly, we really just want to relax because we're so bound up. And we have to understand that this is a practice of awakening. We want the tranquility because it supports the clarity. We want to wake up because we're not just here to reduce stress. We're here to see what we're not seeing so we don't keep falling into the same patterns that are so self-destructive. So I really appreciate the comment about sleepiness. Remember these five hindrances, wanting, aversion, too little energy, sleepiness, dullness, too much energy, restlessness, worry, and the spinning of doubt. So that when you're having a difficult time in your sit, then just that wisdom awareness goes, okay, honey, what of the hindrances are present right now? And you see already that brightens the mind. Like, oh, it's kind of fun. It's like a puzzle. Yeah, what is moving here? Is it doubt? How's the energy level? Too little, too much? Is the mind wanting something? Is the mind wanting to get rid of something? What is it that's not being seen here? And chances are this list of five is enough that whatever it is, you can kind of, knowing these five things will help you get closer because that's the whole point is to actually feel and see what's present so it's nine o'clock i want to respect your time really appreciate people showing up two more classes i'll be here next week for week five we'll bring in the attitude of loving kindness and compassion because it really uh, uh, supports the intimacy with the present moment and then week six, Shelley Graff will be back to teach week six. And a lot of what we cover in week six um, is integrating practice throughout the day. And there are other topics too for that. So I wish you good luck in your practice. And I sent out an email this uh, afternoon. It has the first three recordings there. If you want to re-listen or use the guided meditations from the class, and I'll pass out or send out the recording from tonight, a little bit later this week. Take care, everybody. Thanks for being here. Have a good night.